today we're going to do the second uh, part of the small orchard uh, uh, sessions. I believe last week that you talked about insect control and small orchards, and today I'm going to talk about the actual horticultural aspects and, and, you know, and allude to some of the pest management, but really my focus today is the actual horticultural management uh, of orchards. And as we uh, move through this, today my main objective is if you're thinking about putting in either tree fruit or small fruit, that today you understand somewhat at a basic level um, the key site selection um, characteristics, um, some information about varieties, and particularly when we're talking about apples, uh, rootstock selection, and then overall planting and training. We're going to talk about some of the annual pruning uh, that is necessary for a lot of these woody perennials, and particularly when we're talking about, again, on apple in particular, we're going to talk about annual thinning of uh, those both chemically and manually on tree fruit. So. Let's kind of move into some generalities about tree fruit as we go in this. And you'll see on the note, I've got a little, um, when we're talking about site selection here, is that for most of our perennial um, uh, tree fruit and small fruit, what we're looking for are trying to place these plants in premium sites. But if we're talking about, you know, really doing this and, and wanting to be sustainable, you want to be in uh, premium ground. And for that, uh, most perennial fruit are not suited to low areas or poorly drained areas. And so you'll see a lot of um, tree fruit, and particularly as you move in the south where they have peaches and some of the European grapes, that you'll see them on hillsides uh, so that they can have some good air drainage. But you won't see them at the bottom of the hill because that's where uh, cold air has a tendency to pool. So that's one of the first concepts is that you're really looking for um, relatively uh, frost-free areas when you're talking about orchard plants, whether they're tree fruit or small fruit. There are really quite a few things uh, that need to go in before uh, you buy any nursery stock. Remember, these are very long-lived plants. Um, if you're in this for commercial production, you have to do this right so that um, you can be sustainable and actually have a positive income over these. And so when I talk about long-term, you go with something like a blueberry plant that can easily, um, you know, have a 40-year life if well-established and planned properly um, compared to if you jump down to something uh, like a fully dwarf apple apple tree, um, that usually can easily have 15 to 20 years of good productivity on it. So again, um, on this slide, what we're talking about is that you really need to spend considerable effort into your site selection, um, because if you do a poor job in this and the trees or the bushes don't perform well, then you've got an investment that um, is going to require even additional income to make any corrections. So it can be rather expensive. So. We're going to be talking about some soil preparation and planting plants. So before you order the plants, some of the things that you need to know are the pollination needs of plants. So um, what I'm leading into is some of these plants um, actually require another cultivar to have pollination occur. So we're going to talk about which plants require that which plants can stand on their own. And this really becomes important um, when you're a small orchard. And, you know, when they're small orchards, they have a, have a tendency to have a lot more uh, diversity in plants as opposed to a large orchard that has a tendency to have large blocks of the same tree. So there's a little bit um, differences um, between small orchards and large ones, how they're planted. So let's talk about um, some of the pollination needs, um, some of the winter hardiness considerations, and um, as you've already done, susceptibility pests, I'm, I'm going to allude to, although last week you had uh, a good introduction on insect, and next week you're going to have a good introduction on uh, disease control. So let's talk about the optimal planting site. Uh, for all um, small fruit and tree fruit, they require full sunlight. And when we talk about full sunlight, that seems pretty obvious. But they need to have full sunlight all day long. And so a lot of times we have wooded areas and halfway through the day, the tree gets beyond the tree line and then casts shade. So really, when we say 
full sunlight. We're talking about full sunlight all day long. So you really need to be looking at where the shade patterns are on any ground that you're thinking about putting in uh, your little orchard ground. You also need to spend considerable amount of time um, cleaning the site first. So really evaluating what type of weeds you have, particularly uh, perennial weeds. And within perennial weeds, uh, those that are really problematic. So those of you who have Johnson grass or Canada thistles, things that are a challenge to control outright become even more of a challenge when you have them uh, occurring within a perennial crop. You know, remember, once you have the crop established, they are very susceptible to a lot of the uh, herbicides that we might use and, and those are no longer available for your use uh, in an orchard. So um, this is the time that if you're thinking about putting in uh, perennial plants that you, as I say, spend the time ahead of time to really have an optimal site. I can't emphasize enough, um, you know, it's almost with all specialty crops, but really in particular um, with tree fruit and small fruit, they really do not perform well with wet feet. And when I say that, I don't mean just an occasional flooded area where they're underwater. They don't like heavy soils where their feet are wet quite a bit. And so you really need to evaluate uh, soil drainage as well if you're going to establish tree fruit or small fruit. So um, evaluate whether you need to have um, some sort of tiling system put on or whether you just outright need to select another site because not only do they not like standing water, um, they also do not like poorly drained. Uh, and we've also talked about air drainage as well. And so this is the time of the year when we're still having a few uh, light frost that you can kind of be evaluating the area that you're considering putting in or starting your orchard on where the frost patterns are. If you go out to uh, even your yard, you'll notice that some areas uh, when it's it's near freezing, you'll see frost develop, de develop in some areas and not in others. And it really depends on how the wind pattern is down through your property on how well frost develops. So what you're looking for is avoiding those frost pockets. Now we can't always, and if you are uh, planting in frost pockets, you really want to put the plants that are the later bloomers and the more cold hardy. So the things that you would avoid putting in frost pockets are things that are very early bloomers, like if you want to have a couple of apricot trees, those are very early bloomers. Uh, cherries have a tendency to be fairly early. Um, and usually some of the later blooming are things like the apple trees. So again, you can manipulate it, you know, if the area that you have, you're thinking that, you know, maybe there is a little bit of a colder spot, you want to put the plants that are later blooming and have more cold hardiness to them in those areas. And I think that it can be said relative to other plants, specialty crops are very, very susceptible um, to poor uh, water drainage. And so when we're looking at soil characteristics, the word that I want to use is friable, um, a friable fertile soil. And friable means that it has a good texture to it. So when you take a handful of it and you squeeze it, it should hold its form somewhat. Um, but if you were to apply pressure to what that little uh, amount of dirt you just squeezed, it should break apart easily. So what you're looking for is a friable, fertile soil. And if you work well enough ahead of time, if you think that you have, as I say, some drainage issues with tiling, you can also work on amending uh, the organic matter uh, in your soil if you need to break up um, some heavier clay soils or if you have too sandy of soils, um, something like compost, uh, other forms of organic matter are a way to make the soil um, more friable. And I can't emphasize enough on this point as well is that because these crops are very um, long term, you need to start off with the proper fertility levels as well. And we'll get into that. Um, but it is always much easier to take the soil test ahead of time and make adjustments so that you're planting plants uh, in the soil that is already ready to go. It's very difficult to make adjustments on uh, some of the elements uh, if there's a problem and you find out later you're thinking about this, that you do use the time to make sure um, that anything you plant is really going into the best planting site that you can create. 
Now there are going to be some times when wind breaks are going to be beneficial to you, and particularly if you think that you have an area where cold winds are coming through and might create problems um, with desiccation or actually spring frost. So uh, if you're in a very open area, you might want to consider a wind break. There are some uh, p potential benefits to that. Um, and, and depending on which crop you're dealing with, having a ready water supply is beneficial as well. Now, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about strawberries, but strawberries are a perennial crop uh, that sometimes are in orchard operations, and those um, need a ready water supply, for example, for frost irrigation to protect from a spring freeze. But there are also times, if you think back uh, to 2012 when we had such an extreme drought, um, those growers that had a ready water supply were more situated in saving their crop and increasing their fruit size because they had ready water supplies. Again, those should be in your planning cycle on um, do I have uh, a ready water supply uh, in case of a drought situation? Or if you're growing something like a strawberry crop where you're going to have to do something like frost irrigation. So when we're looking at these pre plant recommendations, I usually say start your prep at least one year in advance of planting. And really, particularly if you're doing something um, like blueberry plants where you're most likely going to have to make some adjustments in pH and most likely um, s significant uh, increases in acidity, or in other words, reducing your pH. Um, that usually is a, a relatively um, slow process on getting that pH change if um, your soil tests say that it's something that you can even accomplish. So start working at least a year in advance. Um, I've already mentioned, you know, this allows you to do your fertility changes, but it also allows you to get um, a good evaluation on drainage on the site and also what the weed spectrum is. And so I've already mentioned, um, you know, and I keep saying this over and over, fruit plants hate wet feet. They really hate it. So you need this year um, to be looking at tiling, terracing, or planting on ridges. And a lot of times, um, planting on ridges is one of the cheaper options uh, for doing this, is just to create ridges. So we want to perform soil tests and make appropriate adjustments, and those are both for pH, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, organic matter um, are most critical. Now remember, soil tests are, are really most beneficial for pre-plant. Uh, for most uh, perennial um, woody plants like tree fruit and small fruit, once the crop is established, we move over to relying on tissue analysis and not soil analysis. So keep in mind, soil tests to be taking those now if you didn't already do them in the fall uh, so that you can be working on making any um, changes. Now most fruit crops are, are, are in what we would consider normal uh, soil ranges, and the only exception to that is blueberries. Uh, blueberries require a much more acid soil, and they also require a much higher organic matter, or I should say prefer a much higher organic matter content uh, in their root environment. So those are the only two that are probably, if you're thinking blueberries, that are, are going to take some soil amendments. For the most part, once you do the soil test, you're going to be looking at you know, doing um, uh, maintenance amounts of phosphorus and p potassium and, and nitrogen to get started. Um, There's a quick question there you might not see. If they're okay. asking, can you please describe planting on ridges? Okay. So a ridge is if you take um, um, an implement out in your field um, and create, for lack of a better word, a raised bed. Uh, so you're planting your trees effectively on a raised bed. So a ridge is throwing dirt so that you're making a ridge. Um, and depending on what the plant is, um, you know, for example, if you're having blueberries, we usually recommend that the bed be uh, three to four feet uh, across. Obviously, if you're going to, you know, have trees, um, it would be a larger ridge than that. So um, when we talk about ridges, just kind of think raised bed. Um, to elevate 
uh, the plant up so that if there's um, a rain event or um, drainage off of snow melt or something like that, um, that it goes down in the trough and the, the plants are then up on the ridge. Okay, very good. Okay, um, general fruit pollination requirements. When we talk about the term self-fruitful or self-unfruitful, it really tells you how many cultivars you're going to need to plant of each. So when we have a plant that is self-fruitful, that means that each flower is able to accept pollen from either itself, um, a flower on the same plant, or a flower from a neighboring plant of the same cultivar. So you see these, and that means that you only need one plant or one cultivar. So if you want to have, you know, a small orchard and lots of different um, um, fruit types, um, self-fruitful work right into that because you only need to have at least one. So, for example, if you were living in the in the right climate in Illinois, you could potentially have a peach tree, a nectarine, a European plum, um, an apricot, a tart cherry, a currant, a blueberry, grape, a raspberry, blackberry, blueberry, and strawberry, um, and only have one plant um, but um, and get fruit. Now, on the other hand, if you have a type that is self-unfruitful, it's not quite so easy. Um, you're going to have to have at least two different cultivars. So what this means is if you have something um, like a gala apple, um, gala by itself uh, is not self-fruitful. So it means a second cultivar uh, needs to uh, be planted so that they can cross-pollinate. And so I'm going to say most apples, most pears, most Japanese plums, elderberries, and most sweet cherries are self-unfruitful. Now, when I say most, that should imply to you um, that there are exceptions to every rule, and there are. So in other words, there are apples that are partially self-fruitful, um, there are pears that are partially self-fruitful, and there are examples of sweet cherries that are fully uh, self-fruitful. And really this comes down to that we're, you're working with your uh, nursery. Um, they usually have pollination guidelines that tell you what will pollinate uh, each other. So when you're looking uh, for pollination guides, I can tell you in general, uh, the general rule is, is that a very early flowering cultivar cannot usually pollinate a late flowering one. And that's kind of when you look at a chart, they're listed um, in any of these charts. So if you get on the internet and you just Google and say uh, pollination chart for apples, um, you'll get a chart that will come up that'll just, you know, have like 50 apple varieties. And they're usually listed from earliest blooming to latest blooming. And if you look at the chart overall, you'll see that most apples cannot pollinate themselves, but also early flowering apples cannot pollinate late flowering apples. So if you are, you know, establishing uh, an orchard, when you do your layout, you want to lay it out so that you have uh, proper parent, uh, pollination pairs. And a lot of times um, for apples, for example, you can use something that's like Golden Delicious. Um, it's kind of in the mid-season flowering range and it's and it's really kind of one of those general purpose pollinators. It's, it's in the season that there's overlap with their early flowers and a lot of times there's overlap with the late ones too. So it acts as a good pollinator for a lot of different apples across. Not for everything, but again, uh, even myself, I have to look at charts to see what will pollinate what when we are talking about self-unfruitful cultivars on that. So um, there's also examples of not the norm. And so as I already mentioned to you, there are some apples that are considered partially to fully self-fruitful. And so, you know, if you're planting Braeburn, Golden Delicious, Granny Smith, Red Rome, these are all partially self-fruitful, meaning that one tree uh, can produce fruit. But uh, in almost all cases, 
um, even those that are considered fully self fruitful, you can almost always improve fruit set by having a second cultivar. So I'll just put that in your mind. Even though it's not always required, um, there are some uh, in almost all cases that will benefit from having cross-pollination. We see that quite commonly in blueberries. Uh, though they don't absolutely need it, um, it's generally better uh, if you do have a second cultivar uh, to improve pollination. Now, the other not the norm is, is there are certain apples, for example, that have pollen which is sterile, meaning that it, they cannot pollinate anything. So you can see the list here of several that I have listed that actually are pollen sterile. These are also called triploid apples. So if you get on the internet and, and type in triploid apples or pollen sterile apples, you can see um, more than what I have listed here. But let's use, let's say that you want to grow Jana Gold. And you know, though, it has uh, sterile pollen. So how do you get John of Gold apples? Well, clearly you have to plant a second cultivar of another apple uh, to be its pollinating pair. So let's say that you plant John of Gold with, um, you know, uh, Gala. Uh, I'm just rounding those off the top of my head. Well, fine, Gala is going to pollinate John of Gold, but what is going to pollinate the Gala? And so you can see here that you actually need a third cultivar um, so that all of them can be pollinated. So those are just some of the examples of that. When you are selecting cultivars, um, you really need to do a little bit of research, and the best source of information is the nurseryman himself uh, to tell you what pollinators will work with them. But I just want to introduce this to you, that it's not always just as simple as just planting uh, your favorite single cultivar. Sometimes you need to have more. So um, you also need to be somewhat aware of how does that pollen move, um, because there, in some cases, uh, you either need to um, have plantings on your property that enhance our local pollinators or invite in, you know, the wild honeybees, or um, there are some cases if you have enough uh, in your area that you can, you know, have your own beehives or bring in beehives. And so you really need to be aware of which uh, fruit crops uh, rely on insects to carry pollen. And you, as you can see, I have a list here. Um, the strawberries, the blueberries, apples, plums, and sweet cherries are the ones that, that rely more heavily on insects to carry pollen uh, than on wind. And so those that rely um, pretty much on gravity and wind are the peaches and grapes. Now, those that rely on gravity and wind, that does not mean that insects don't do some of the pollination, but it is mostly gravity and wind that does it. So um, that's just some good information. Um, as I say, if you're planning on putting in a, a small orchard, that does not mean that you have to immediately uh, order some commercial beehives, but you might think about or evaluate whether you have sufficient um, plantings in and around your property that would be inviting or contribute to the increase of local pollinators um, throughout the season. Um, that's the way that I work it on my uh, small orchard is that I spent you know, considerable amount of time just kind of walking through uh, nurseries looking to see what plants are, are blooming at different periods. So I work on having um, in, flowers in bloom that are known to be good um, uh, nectar sources and pollen sources for uh, the local pollinators throughout the area. So that's, those are a couple of different um, ways that you can approach uh, when you're relying on insects to carry your pollen. I will point out to you that some of our uh, issues with fruit crops are due to poor pollination. Um, you can do everything correct and Mother Nature mess you up. Um, you know, for example, um, we've had uh, pecan failures. Uh, pecans, you know, fall into this orchard setting. And they rely on uh, wind, usually wind and gravity, to move their pollen. But in cases 
where it is extremely uh, uh, rainy and windy during that time period, sometimes we don't have good pollination occurring. And that's, again, um, because of Mother Nature. Also, even uh, weather affects some of our pollinators. So there are, there are times when, um, while we're in bloom, if it's extremely wet and rainy, um, some of our pollinators just don't go out and do their job. So there's a possibility that we have reduced pollination just because of weather uh, conditions as well. Now I want to point out something else that can uh, affect pollination. Uh, with this extremely cold weather that we've had right now, we're already aware of pretty significant um, bud kill in our peach crop. And for the most part, uh, apples are looking pretty good. Where we're not so sure are the buds that are not killed as to whether any of the flower structure on the inside has been damaged. And so there will be, for those of you who, you know, are maybe beginning orchard people or even people who are experienced have seen this before where we still have live buds on the trees, but it was cold enough that there was some damage done to, you know, maybe the, the, the pistols or, or something to that effect that pollination cannot be completed. And what we'll see is, I'll give an example, let's say peaches, um, if some of the flower structure, the bud hasn't been outright killed, but something in the flower has been damaged because of cold, we might actually see a small peach set, but because it didn't get pollinated properly, it will just drop off. So we'll have a heavy fruit drop, and that usually is related to um, failure to pollinate due to freeze injury. Let me move on. Unfortunately, um, we love fruit crops. Well, so do a lot of vertebrate pests. And I've given you some examples here. Um, this picture that's on the left-hand side where the three T posts with the, the tape wrapped around it, this is one of our larger orchards in Illinois. This is their approach for every one of their fruit trees that they put in. And so the T posts are put around so that the, the buck, the deer, uh, doesn't rack their trees. And the tape that's wrapped around it is to keep the females and the fawns from sticking their head. They just really don't like to stick their head through um, that tape. And so every one of the new trees that they set have this because they have such severe uh, disease or, or deer pressure. And in the lower picture, this is a small orchard that I visited and they failed to remove the tree guards. Um, they had put the tree guards in because they were doing some mowing and some herbicide applications and, and they just didn't take it off. Well, that tree guard posed a perfect place for a mouse to just have a protected environment to get in. So you can see where the whole trunk has been uh, girdled and they, they lost every one of their apple trees in this small little block just because of that simple little um, failure to remove a tree guard uh, before winter came on. And then in the, uh, the right-hand picture, these are uh, grape growers, and we were doing a demonstration at a workshop on putting netting on, and this is for uh, bird control, obviously. And this is quite common. This is a process that uh, is done for blueberries as well. So birds are quite a bit of a, an issue uh, in both uh, grapes and and blueberries, and it's something that needs to be in your planting process. Even if you have a few plants, uh, you need to be thinking ahead on how you're going to protect it because they can wipe out your crop in, in a fairly quick hurry. Some of your other considerations that you need to think about, particularly here with some of our past experiences, irrigation. I somewhat mentioned this in the introduction. Um, most often needed, if you're planning on putting in full dwarf apples, so full dwarfing stock, um, you're going to want to have uh, at least irrigation to get established. Um, brambles as well are fairly high users of water. Um, that would be the, the blue uh, raspberries and blackberries. And for strawberries, mostly for frost protection, and blueberries almost required because they require a uniform soil moisture more so um, than a lot of our other crops. So in all of those, um, I'm, I'm going to say that you really need to be um, almost a requirement that irrigation be part of your planning. Some other things that you need to consider, um, whether you are growing something that needs to be staked and or trellised. So um, in your cost analysis on inputs, there are certain crops that absolutely uh, need to have support throughout the life of the crop. Um, so 
all uh, dwarf, full dwarf rootstocks on apples require some form of either a post and or a trellis system. Um, and there are a few semi-dwarf uh, apple rootstocks that require at least uh, staking through uh, the first few years of life. And once you put that support in at the beginning, usually they'll just stay for their life. Uh, grapes require a trellis. Now, I'm not going to go into all the different kinds of trellis, but there are different trellises for low vigor grape cultivars, and then there are uh, trellis designs that are for high vigor. So it's not one fits all. It really depends on what cultivar you're growing as to what type of, of training system you're using. And also when you get into the semi-erect blackberries, these are traditionally the thornless type. Um, they are not freestanding and they require a trellis. Now I'm showing one of the more uh, newer um, methods of growing blackberries in the lower left hand side. Um, this is a movable arm trellis where it switched back and forth so that you can um, lay the blackberries flat um, and expose one side to the sun so that you can orient all the blossoms to one side um, on this. So this is, it's, it's somewhat like growing grapes. So they are pruned similar to grapes in that they have cordons and then uh, shoots grow up. So this is a much more managed than using just a traditional trellis system. Now that's not to say that with blackberries you can't just use a traditional, um, you know, um, cross arm trellis that has a support wire throughout. So I wanted to just show you some of the um, more advanced types of trellises um, that are in research right now. So when we're talking about selecting cultivars, I'm assuming that we have some people that are, um, you know, either being organic or sustainable, but there might also be people that are considering being conventional growers. In all cases, uh, understanding the cultivars you select, but it is very important that if you are in one of the reduced pesticides or the organic methods that you really research and try to select cultivars that have the most disease resistance. Now, unfortunately, those with uh, disease resistance are not always the best tasting or the best quality. Um, it, it seems like that um, there are always several that are very good. And I've given an example here. Uh, honey eye, which is considered a main crop strawberry, has good powdery mildew resistance. And then uh, to the right in the picture, this is early glow. Um, this is one of the earliest uh, strawberries that just tastes wonderful, but it, you know, is offset that it has very small size. But one of the other problems is it's, it's fairly powdery mildew susceptible. So this is my example that if you're being organic, this adds an additional problem uh, if you grow something that is known to be disease susceptible because you have re reduced options uh, possibly in, in some of the diseases that we have. Uh, for example, we don't have a really good organic control for black rot in grapes. So um, it, it really, uh, when you're talking about certain crops, it is best to really look um, for the best disease resistance. Now, um, you need to think about uh, marketability, and when I talk about that, it's know what you can sell in your area. Um, you know, we have a lot of growers that um, if they sell something in one market, they can get a premium uh, for selling it, and they can sell everything they grow. Um, they can come back to their home market and not be able to push it just because the market's not there. Um, a good example is, is let's say, um, strawberries. Um, maybe there are a whole gob of star strawberries where the local market is and so they don't have a strong market because there's a lot of competition. Um, but if you move to a market where there are not strawberries, um, maybe you can sell better. So you really need to be uh, considering where your market is, how you're going to market before you plant anything. Um, think about harvest windows, you know, on what your labor force is. You know, do you have the people to pick? Um, do you have the time management for taking care of the crop, um, all of that, um, and do you need um, more than one thing? Like when strawberries are coming in, do you need to have something else like asparagus? You need to be looking at how windows overlap so that you have a uh, good market. 
And a lot of times because we're local, we're looking at taste as a premium. And this is one of the benefits, you know, as opposed to um, that we can really sell. When people go to the grocery store, a lot of the products that are in the grocery store, if they didn't come from a very local market, they have to stand up to some level of shipping, um, some level of storage as well. And so that's one of the things as a local seller that you can really uh, sell on is locally grown and, and for taste. Um, if you plan on uh, being a shipper of any level, um, you need to consider that as well. Um, there are some fruits that are highly delicate. I can give an example if you decide that you want to go into the restaurant market and sell um, yellow raspberries. They have a tendency to be um, very delicate. And so that would go into your consideration about, you know, that's not something that you would ship and pack, it would be something that you would handle more with kid gloves um, and do uh, direct delivery. So uh, again, thinking about shipping quality. Um, adapted to hey, Elizabeth, Yes. Yes. I, I just want to hit this for everybody. Elizabeth just hit on a, a huge key point here, several of them there, especially if you're a new grower getting into this. You know, she talked about there may have been things, you know, that you like to grow, varieties that you like to grow and have you, but if you can't sell them and you're wanting to get into the local food business, it's really something to consider. And I know working with a lot of, of very new uh, small farm producers, sometimes they forget about that because if you can't sell it, there's not much use uh, in, in growing it, you know, as part of your business. So those last two minutes you had were really, really key things. You can look in uh, nursery catalogs and they'll say, um, let's say that Gewurztraminer is is hardy down to zone five. Well, the problem is is that on January seventh, um, our temperatures drop well below zone five, and so most years um, you could probably get away with it. But when you're in commercial production, you can't afford to have um, a 2014 where your entire planting was killed off. Um, that's an unusual year. It deviated from the 30-year average. So you really, um, really need to research this on why is no one growing Gewurz demeanor. Um, there's a reason, and it usually has something to do with unreliable hardiness. Um, I've already mentioned susceptibility of pests, and this is another one, this ease or difficulty of production. You really need to consider what your skill set is. Um, do not start off with the most difficult crop to grow. Um, if you do, don't plant a whole lot of it. Get a feel for it. And when I say difficult, um, things that I would put up as difficult would be um, apples, for example. Um, they have numerous pests um, and, and so many different environmental issues that can cause problems. So that's something that I would say, you know, plant just a few of them so you can get your feet wet on it without having a huge uh, investment in plant material. So really hard assessment of what your skill set is and use, you know, a year or two to really learn about these crops. Now, it's already mentioned, I mentioned it a little bit, cost of production. You have to have a, you know, uh, this has to make money, too, uh, throughout this. So, um, but really, you need to be running the pencil on the cost. And, and if you get on the Internet, there's usually budgets, uh, enterprise budgets for a lot of these to kind of get you started on this. And I also want to point out time commitment. Surprisingly, uh, so many times I have people, I'll be out and making visits and I'll be asking about some problem and, and a lot of times the answer is I just didn't have time to take care of it. Um, go into all of these slowly so that you can, you know, manage your time and, and see how it works for you. These are all really important. When we're talking about a potential to lose a crop due to early season cold temperatures, for example, um, why do we not grow apricots all over Illinois? It's not because a tree is not hardy, it's because the crop is not reliable. Um, apricots bloom so early that there is a really high probability um, that there will be bloom damage and, which results in crop loss. Uh, so when I say um, apricots and sweet cherries, uh, if they are not grown in a high tunnel situation, there is a very good likelihood that they're not a reliable cropper for you. When we talk about peaches and nectarines, those move somewhat into the zone six area of the state. Um, most of the commercial production uh, is where the Illinois 
uh, confluence with the Mississippi occurs, and south of that is where most of our peach. Uh, you get north of that, you start having an increasing likelihood of spring kill. Um, you get a little bit more hardiness when you're talking about plums and pears and sour cherries, and apples are our most or least likely to have um, frost injury. Um, now the northern tier of the state sees it a lot more often. I want to say the last time that we lost our entire fruit crop for the most part, there are a few exceptions. In 2007 we had a very late uh, five day freeze over Easter and it took out uh, the entire apple and peach crop throughout the state and that had not happened I think for about 50 years. Uh, so apple is not as commonly taken out, um, but this year um, much of our peach crop has been taken out in the Mississippi, Illinois River confluence area. I think the southern part of the state is is pretty well. But I've got some pictures here on you know what makes uh, apple and apple growers sad um, when you see a burned up bloom like pictured in the center. And also when the bloom is not completely killed, um, you see some frost rings are scarring on the fruit. We call it a frost ring. Again, that's evidence that there was a, a freezing event uh, during the bloom uh, period. Now let's talk about on apple rootstock selection. This is a picture of me and I'm standing by a standard tree or one that is not on a dwarfing rootstock. So you can get an idea of what an apple tree um, looks like when it has no dwarf effect on it at all. And these trees can, you know, easily, these are just a landscape tree, these can easily live, you know, several decades. Um, so they're very large um, and very long-lived. As you dwarf them, their their life uh, is decreased. So the more dwarf, the, lo the shorter their life is um, on there. So when we're looking at apple rootstocks, the selection of a rootstock is just as important as selecting um, the crop that you're going to harvest. So this is a very important decision. And so these are some of the things that you consider when you're selecting rootstocks. Um, the woolly apple aphid resistance. Does it have fire blight resistance? That's, you'll learn about fire blight next week. It's a bacterial disease, very serious in Illinois. Um, replant issues, um, the soil um, diseases like Phytophthora, how cold hardy it is, um, what is its per precocity, you know, on, on does it promote early uh, fruiting, uh, does it make it, you know, fruit later, how much suckering, and so I've got an example here of a rootstock that suckers heavily. And so this is a management um, issue that you have to take care of every year. Uh, so there are some rootstocks that sucker heavily like what is pictured here. Um, there are some that do not sucker at all. There are some that have heavy burr knots. Uh, so if you think about a knot uh, in a tree, um, this is a, why this is important, this is a really good site for a lot of the uh, boring insect. Um, they really uh, are attracted to those burrs and that's where we see boars go in. And also nursery friendly. You know guys, you can get on the internet and really research all these nifty new um, rootstocks that are coming out, but not all of the nurseries are adopting them because they're difficult to propagate or, you know, there's problems with um, um, doing the grafting. Uh, so. As I say, if you go to somewhere like uh, Cornell that does a lot of apple root uh, rootstock research, um, you can you can see all kinds of rootstocks there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a nursery is carrying them. And so right now I'm going to say that we're probably running, oh, maybe two years out on most uh, apple orders. So meaning that if you've decided what rootstock you want, uh, what cultivar you want to put on, uh, It'll probably, you won't probably get trees until 2015 and possibly 2016. That's both for apples and peaches. Uh, in this day and age, nurseries making sure that they're only doing grafts on order. So, you know, whatever is order is pretty much what they're grafting. So they're not doing any speculating uh, right now. So they're, they're really reducing their risk. So you need to do a lot of research. 
um, and, and get your order in now so that you can get started. I really um, encourage you to start now if you're thinking about apples and that you don't just um, accept whatever is left over. Um, that uh, once you've decided what you want, um, that you just go ahead and put the order in and wait for it. Now I'm not just I'm not going to go over detail on all these, but I just want to give you an idea uh, about the most common apple rootstocks and those Elizabeth, that are in the, yes. Just a real quick question. Uh, there's a question here. Obviously, you can't market uh, apples with frost strain, but are they okay to eat? Yes. What that is is kind of like a, a scarring on the skin or a roughness. Like if you've ever, you know, the olden days, russet apples uh, have that. So, yeah, it's just a cosmetic defect. There is no um, um, really not even noticeable on the palate if you peel it. And there are some markets that would be willing um, that you could sell those, but again, there's there's nothing on uh, dietary problems uh, with it. Thank you. Uh, so the dwarf ones, I'm just going to give you an idea of some of the names. Uh, B9, and I will point out that there are several clones of these, but B9, M9, and M26. And so that means that uh, a B9 is 20% of a full-size tree, so they can really be brought down in size. Uh, a semi-dwarf would be um, like an M7, and it's about 60% of a full-size tree. And then there are semi-standard, uh, which are about 70% of a freestanding tree. And so um, you notice that I say that the dwarfs require support, except maybe M26, but even that one I would probably put support on it. Uh, M7 definitely needs support um, at least early on until they're well established, like the first five years or so. Um, but the M106 and 111 uh, are freestanding and do not require support. But I've got some pictures here that I took um, in an orchard that has um, the same apple on different rootstocks. And I just want to show you the effect of rootstock. On the upper picture is the rootstock G30. Now you notice it's not in the list. G30 is one of the newer uh, rootstocks. Um, but you can see that it causes naturally wide branch angles. That's one of the benefits. When we get into apples, a lot of times um, to avoid bark inclusions, you do a lot of training to make wider branch angles. Um, and G30 has naturally wide branch angles. But you look down at B9, um, and they're fairly upright. And that is directly the effect of a rootstock. So as I say, when you're doing uh, research on these rootstocks, um, branch angle is something else that you want to look at so that you have an idea of the level of, of training uh, that you're going to do in your printing and training operation. When we're talking about rootstocks, most of these are seedling, meaning that um, they don't offer any um, dwarfing effect. Really what they are is, is good um, so, uh, in, in soil conditions and hardiness. So um, for the most part, um, unless you're above the confluence of the Illinois um, Mississippi River area, if you're going to attempt to grow a few peach trees north of that, um, it really doesn't make a difference on these. But if it does, um, I have down here an increasing cold hardiness. So meaning that Bailey of the four I have listed here uh, would be the most cold hardy. So if you're pushing the edge of what we consider normal peach growing area, um, you're definitely going to want to go with a Bailey or a Tennessee natural and avoid the Halford and, and Lovell uh, if you're in one of the colder areas. I see a question, is espalier common in commercial apple orchards? Our full dwarf apple orchards are almost espaliered, except for they are not two-dimensional like most espaliered is. So when you talk about um, a high-density uh, dwarf orchard, it is fully trellised and staked. Um, and But um, espalier usually is against a flat surface or really kind of two-dimensional. It's not a three-dimensional tree. So in actuality, I would say no, espalier is not common in um, any scale of commercial orchard, um, but when you go into high density planting with trellis, you are approaching it, uh, except for it does have three-dimensionality to it. 
Okay, I just threw this picture. This is a grower that I work with. I just wanted you to get an idea of what a fully mature, fully pruned peach tree looks like to give you an idea of what it will look like when it's in the prime of its life to give you a um, scale of size. So that's the only reason for that picture. So uh, when you're going to a nursery, buy high quality. Um, you don't want to get into buying large trees. Uh, you want to make sure that you stick to around that half inch diameter, none of that three quarter uh, diameter. So um, go with a reliable nursery. There are a lot of nurseries, but there are some more reliable than others. Um, I recommend that you go with bare root uh, that's shipped when they're dormant. And you have a, a couple of choices. The most common is probably what we're going to call a one year old whip, which is a single stem. Uh, but there are also, which are more expensive, what we call a feathered tree. And this is usually a two-year-old tree that has several branches on them. Um, so if you get a feathered tree that has really good branch arrangement on it, it might be worth um, that added year in the nursery, um, as opposed to if you buy a feathered tree and it has really bad branching angle, like too high up starting or something of that effect, and you end up cutting everything off anyway and starting back uh, as a whip, then it wasn't worth it. So again, um, you really need to, when you're talking to your nursery, be very specific about what it is that you want. Don't be hesitant about uh, requesting quality stock. So here's a, uh, just pictures to show you on the left is what a, a feather tree would look like, and on the right is what a whip looks like. Let's assume that you've you know, done all your prep and you've got your trees and they finally arrived. They um, should arrive dormant when the buds are not open. Um, you need to make sure that you keep them moist at all times. Uh, so they need to be someplace where they're kept cool and moist. And if you cannot uh, get them planted immediately, they need to be kept near freezing temperatures uh, and covered with sawdust uh, in an unheated cellar or someplace like that. Um, so that they can be kept really cool and the sawdust kept moist. Um, avoid storing anything with fruits or vegetables that produce ethylene because that will um, bring them out of dormancy all the more quicker. So they need to be uh, somewhat isolated from other plant material uh, like fruits or vegetables. Now you have a couple of choices on how to plant, and it really depends on how many plants you're planting, on whether you need mechanization or not. If you're just planting a few uh, trees or bushes, then you can obviously do it with just a shovel and by hand. Um, the more you plant, uh, the more mechanization that you need. But the main thing is that when you're planting by hand or auger, you need to soak the roots in water uh, for uh, a few hours. Uh, before planting so that they can get fully hydrated and make sure that you examine the roots and cut off anything that looks damaged. Um, you want to place the tree in the center of the hole and fill it back up with topsoil. But one of the most important critical things is that if you have a grafted tree, and most of these are, the graft union needs to be two to three inches above the soil surface. And this is after everything has settled. There's been a lot of times I've seen trees planted that at the original planting, it was at grade. And then when the soil settled, um, it, the, the graft union was well below grade. So this needs to be uh, two to three inches after the soil has settled. Now what will happen is if that, that uh, graft union gets below grade, it can actually root. So the scion, which is the top part of the tree, can root and lose all the dwarfing effect of your rootstock, and particularly on apples. And so the higher the graft union above the soil, the smaller the tree also. So you can actually rut your tree out by having the graft union too high. Uh, so about two to three inches above the soil surface after the soil has settled is good. And so this is just showing you some options. If you're not doing by hand, here's an auger on the back end of a tractor for digging a hole. And again, if you have a, a large number, you might want to, you know, move, rent an auger. And then, uh, you know, if you're working with somebody that's doing a lot of trees, you might step up to an actual tree planter. And again, the tree planter is usually for a large number, and probably not uh, the group that we're talking to today. Now, when we're talking about training and pruning, Pruning is the annual uh, removal or, or renewal of fruiting surfaces, but there's also some training that goes on. And this is where you're directing tree growth into the shape that you want. Um, and as I mentioned, some 
um, um, trees have a tendency to grow very upright, have very narrow crotch angles. And one of the problems with all trees that have narrow crotch angles is as the tree grows, those crotch angles grow together and it causes some, some, some breakage on there. So you're really looking at um, training to make nice flat um, branch angles and we're going to focus today on just two. Now there's lots of tree training, but today I'm just going to talk about central leader and open center. Now traditionally, the central leader is what most um, apple trees, pear trees are on. And for lack of a better word, this is the Christmas tree shape, where it's very narrow at the top and very wide at the bottom. So it has one main trunk that is usually five to eight feet high. Uh, the lowest branch is usually about knee height at 18 to 22 inches from the ground. Um, there are usually four to seven large scaffold branches that are about 48 inches in rise vertically, um, kind of spiraling around the tree. And branch angles are usually maintained at 40 to 90 degrees on there. So you get your trees in, and the first thing, you, let's say that you have a whip first thing you're going to do is, is cut off or tip the tree about 30 inches above ground. Or if you have some good feathers, you can do it 8 to 12 inches above the top good uh, feather on there. And so as this, you're going to start looking at whether you need to use spreaders at this point for some real upright growth. And when you have young growth, you can do this with closed pins, uh, simple things like that. On larger branches, we're getting into some wood spreaders. And I'm going to have some pictures on there as well. So when you have a, a brand new tree that you're plant, planting, uh, just as you inspected the roots, you're going to make sure that you remove any broken or any downward growing branches because all of those um, are just undesirable wood. The open center is like a footed base. Um, this is a single trunk that's about 18 to 30 inches high, and at the top of the trunk then you'll have two to five scaffold branches that kind of um, uh, um, initiate all at the same place. Um, and the crotch angles, again, are 40 to 90 inches. So you can see some progression. Uh, the lower left hand is, is how the tree uh, has the initial cut on the feathered tree, um, and the tree two years later, and then a whole um, planting of open center trees. So they look like little footed bases. Um, so in other words, there's nothing on the inside. The center is completely clean. All branches that are facing on the inside are removed, and all branches are pruned so that they're always going out and up. Uh, when you're in an open center system. And traditionally, um, the peaches and nectarines are in this open center. Now, when I say traditionally, that does not mean that a peach can't be grown in a central leader and that an apple can't be grown into an open center. Um, it's just for production. Um, uh, the peaches seem to do um, slightly better in the open center, and the apples are more in central leader. But as I say, um, uh, Mother Nature sometimes forces you. I've seen a lot of uh, apple trees that started out as central leaders, and as they progressed in age, just slowly because the scaffold dieback have turned into open centers as well. So over time, that could help as well. Peaches and nectarines, open center, training and pruning, ant planting. If the tree is unbranched, head the leader around that 26 to 30 inches. Then you'll have several branches that will, uh, or buds that will break, and that will cause the scaffold branches. And at that point, you're going to select those three or four branches that you want to be uh, your scaffold, scaffold branches. So it's, it's fairly a straightforward way of creating the tree. So this is just some pictures of at planting. You see that initial cut on the far left and then the resulting branches that form around that cut are slightly below. And this is where you're going to select those three to four that you want to be um, your scaffold branches. So these are just uh, pictures from the top view and then a drawing of what you're looking at if you stand over the top of the tree and look down. And again, just some more pictures of um, some peach trees again with the um, you can see where the heading cut was and then the four branches that broke and resulted. Um, the tree a few years later 
and then the tree yet again uh, when it's fully mature. So again, nothing maintained in the center. All branches are pruned uh, so that they're always going upward and outward. When we're talking about care of young trees, I think one of the most important things is that you remove grass and weed competition. You absolutely cannot have turf right up to the trunk. So you need to have two to three feet from the base of the tree completely bare. Now as the trees get much older, you can start letting that turf come in a little bit closer, but when they're very young, you need to have it completely bare. Um, you also, now this was in relation to the question uh, earlier, you do want to prevent premature bearing. And so for tree fruit, you're removing the first food growing season, the crop on there. So if anything's uh, produced, you're going to remove it from the tree. So no crop the first year. Um, particularly in apples, if you crop an apple tree too soon, it can permanently runt it out. Um, and the tree just will never um, reach its full size and it just will never reach its full cropping potential. So you really need to, I know it's difficult, but you really need to stick to this. And I've got some pictures on some different levels of limb spreader. You see in the lower left, there's a little uh, weight that's hanging off a branch to pull it down more horizontally. Um, in the upper uh, right hand corner, you can see some uh, wood. Uh, that is used, it has some cut off nails on the end so that it um, pokes into the wood a little bit. And the tree can tolerate this. Um, again, ways to uh, flatten out branches on there. And you also need to protect pests. You've seen the picture uh, in the center. And also uh, you can see some bar soap hanging in the lower right hand corner. Again, even though you're not producing a crop yet, they are uh, attractive to certain pests. And so you do need to protect. Uh, against those. So here's why you're so concerned about trying to get that branch angle closer to a horizontal plane. Uh, the more vertical the shoot, the more vigorous it is. And so if you have these shoots growing upright, you always have excessive competition with the leader. So this is one of the ways to reduce some of your pruning uh, by getting this more horizontal shoots. Um, the vertical shoots also have stronger buds, so obviously you're kind of doing a balancing act. You don't want to get them too flat because you don't want to lose all of your vigor. So the, it's kind of a bring it somewhat horizontal so that you can reduce some of the vigor but also have good bud strength. Um, and so you never want to have um, the shoots that are below the horizontal plane. Those are very weak wood, and those are, if you just have some naturally growing, those are targets for being pruned out, anything that is bl growing below the horizontal plane. When we're talking about fruit formation, branch angle also affects your number of fruit and size. Um, you have with really upright, um, very few larger fruit, but when you have them down horizontal, you have more fruits of a more moderate size. So this is our way of getting a more uniform crop rather than all different sizes across the board. Um, this is a way of evening it out. And again, don't want any of those below horizontal. So these are just some pictures of annual pruning um, to reduce the amount of um, pruning surfaces or fruiting surfaces in a tree. Um, you kind of have to keep in mind as we go through here that a certain age of wood is more pr productive on trees. And so let's kind of move into that. When we have apples, apples are usually born terminally on shoots or short spurs. And if you see in the upper right, that's a picture of a fruit spur. Uh, the middle is a, uh, flat, a standard flower cluster where there's one in the center and four around it. So the center one is called the king blossom, and those around it is the court. And usually the center blossom, the king blossom, opens first. When we're talking about peaches, they're usually solitary flowers, and they're usually on axillary buds of last year's growth. So immediately in your mind, you should say, hmm, on peaches, I don't need, um, I need to regulate how much of last year's growth I keep. Because if it's always born on last year's growth and you don't cut last year's growth back, you'll end up having a very tall tree with fruit way out of your reach. So this is one of the reasons with peaches that knowing that it's born on last year's growth, that we usually, let's say that we had three feet of new growth last year, we'll usually shorten that down to like 18 inches. 
um, and fruit the tree on that. So that's one of our ways of keeping height down. Now on apples, the fruiting is usually on two-year-old wood. So again, uh, we don't need to keep a whole lot of that new growth. So this is one of our ways of manipulating um, the tree because we know what age of wood uh, the fruit is born. So we don't have these huge trees. We can use pruning and still have good fruiting wood. These are some pictures of apple buds. Um, on the left, it starts with the leaf bud. The center picture is fruit spurs. Um, the upper right is a fruit bud, and the lower is what the bloom looks like. So on peach buds, as I mentioned, the flower buds are born on one-year-old wood. So what happens if you prune a peach tree and you prune off all of last year's wood? Um, you're not going to have any crops. So you do have to retain some of last year's wood so that you have a crop this year. Trees are usually fertilized annually. Um, depending on what the crop load is depends on how we uh, fertilize. When we're doing annual fertilization, for example, um, on a mature tree this year, uh, the growers will not fertilize as much because they don't have a crop. Um, and so if they over fertilize, then they'll have too much vigor on the tree. So a lot of growers will do split applications. They'll do one in early spring uh, about this time. They only put half down and then wait to see uh, what the crop looks like. And then if they have a crop, they'll put the sec second half down. Well, for most peach growers, around the confluence of the Illinois Mississippi, they already know they don't have a crop. So they're only going to be putting a maintenance amount down this year uh, to keep the uh, trees in good condition. So this is just a little cartoon to show you that um, when you're fertilizing trees, you step about a foot out and spread the recommended amount um, out to the drip line. So you don't uh, fertilize the entire orchard floor. It is concentrated underneath the trees themselves. The reason that we thin the crop is to obtain annual production. And what that means to you, particularly in apples, apples are naturally biennial bearers. A lot of nut crops are as well, meaning that they have a tendency to produce a very heavy crop one year, the next year hardly anything. And so when we thin, we're thinning to make that heavy crop lighter so that we can get a bigger crop on the off year. So that's one of the main reasons for thinning. But it also improves fruit quality um, because we have less fruit on the tree, less disease pressure. You know, where fruits touch together is where we have a lot of disease problems. And it also takes some of the weight off the tree and can avoid some limb breakage as well. So let's talk about some of this thinning. Well, you know, if you have just a few trees, you can obviously just hand thin them. Um, but if you start getting a lot more trees and hand thinning is just really not an option time-wise, then there can be mechanical remover like using um, rope thinners, strings, or using clubs by hand. Um, the lower picture is a grower that is using a uh, PVC pipe that has batting on the tip, and he's just kind of batting on the branches, knocking off uh, peach fruit on there. And with apples, we have the most control with chemical thinning. So let's look at some of the details. Uh, on there. So when we're talking about bloom thinning on peaches, um, we have uh, either handmade rope thinners or you can have um, string thinners that usually you have to purchase. So here's a rope thinner. You can see that it's just a, a, a crossbar off of a front end loader that has a whole gob of ropes dangling off of it and it has a counterweight on the tractor. And when they raise the bucket up high, they just drag those ropes right through the tree, and it physically removes a whole gob of blossoms. Now, remember, we only need about 5 to 8 percent of the bloom. So this is one of the ways on a full bloom year um, to knock off some of the blooms physically. And um, the picture that's in the center, the upper one, that is a string thinner. And what I am showing in the lower picture is what the string thinner looks like on a smaller scale. That's a handheld one that's in a power drill. So all of these are our physical remover, removal of the bloom. So on peaches, this is the first pass of thinning, is to actually do some bloom. So when they think they have too much flour on there, they'll physically remove, this is the first pass. And then they'll wait till fruit set to see what they have. And that's when they'll go in then with, you know, PVC 
uh, pipes and, and bat the branches when the fruit is loose. There will be a point at which small fruits will drop off with a little bit of abrasion to the tree. And so they'll just go along and bat and knock off a whole gob. And then they'll have a third pass where they will hand thin down to the final density. So peaches are for the most part, even on the largest scale, almost all um, mechanically removed. There's not a whole lot of chemical thinning. Uh, done in peaches. It's almost all mechanical. Now let's talk about some chemical thinning of apples. Um, if you're interested in this, I recommend that you get um, the thinning guide by Phil Swalyer and also there is the Pennsylvania Tree Fruit Production Guide, um, which if you get online, uh, you can get an order of, of this as well. So these are probably the two best publications for giving details of chemical thinning um, because there is no one formula for it. Uh, every year is different because there are so many variables about how the tree is going to react to thinning. So uh, I do recommend that you read into this if you're going to attempt chemical thinning. Now the thinning materials we're going to be working with, if you're organic you have an option of lime sulfur. And then uh, for those who uh, are not organic, you have several other options that I have listed here. And all of them have their own window in which they can be used. Now, I'm not going to go over a whole lot of detail. I'm just give you a taste of thinning. And so here's the main uh, timing, for example. Um, I have that if you're um, going to do petal fall thinning, uh, NAD is when you can use. And you can see then that you have several other windows uh, to use several of the others. And if you look at the top, you see that 7 is a thinner. And 7 is the same as the insecticide that you're familiar with. And so 7 acts as a fairly um, gentle, I'm going to say a gentle thinner, um, from fruit that is about 6 uh, to 15 um, millimeters in size. So um, once you get past 15, 7 is not effective on there. So uh, if you've ever used 7 on apple trees and noticed fruit drop early on, that's because it's a natural thinner um, on there. So this is kind of an important on uh, what your choices are on thinners. The point at which you would, if you're organic and you're using lime sulfur, uh, would it's not on this slide, but it would be at the full bloom. So where it's the FB, um, that's when you would do um, the lime sulfur. And this is kind of a caustic burning of the flowers, so it somewhat damages the flowers so that they can't completely pollinate. So that's somewhat how that works. Keep in mind that there are fruit tree pests everywhere. So we have pests, both disease and insects, um, all on the trunks, um, the leaves, the roots, the flowers, and the fruit. And my main point in saying this is, is that um, when we're talking about the maintenance of a tree, pest control is one of the most critical issues. And it is very critical even when you're in the first years when you don't have crops. So keep that in mind. There are some real serious pests that can kill your trees before they uh, ever get a chance to produce a crop. So, so uh, if I can answer any other questions, uh, feel free and we'll see what we've got. Thanks, Elizabeth. If you guys are interested in organic fertilizers, one of the best places to look for sources is if you look at the Great Lakes uh, Fruit and Vegetable Expo, uh, particularly if you look at their uh, exhibitors. Uh, I, would, I, I usually go there every year, but there are a number of exhibitors there that specialize in organic fertilizers. It is an excellent place to go if you're new uh, to meet vendors. And as I say, they do a pretty good job of having a lot of vendors that have organic supplies. I want to thank Elizabeth for helping us out here again today. And uh, uh, with that, I guess we'll close today's meeting. Good luck, everyone. Thank you.